Well, I did an awesome intro and then the uh, flip yeah. cam was full. This is so take two. let's try this again. <laughs> Dick Costello, who I was saying, it, I used to have to say was one of my favorite people in tech, right. not the Valley, because you lived in Chicago. Right. Now, as the new CEO of Twitter right. and Valley resident, I can just say one of my favorite people in the Valley. Right, except I'm not really in the Valley, I'm in Marin. Well, that, you know, kind of loosely right. counts. I mean, it's some people in consider the Bay the East Area, Bay. we would say. Okay, Bay Area. But you work in the Valley. I've been and already I know more <laughs> You're about schooling it than me. You do. <laughs> right. So, you know, the. Yes. Twenty billion dollar question, depending yeah. on you know how much you make from right. Twitter eventually, right. is why you did this. I mean, you had a very comfortable life. You had made a ton of money from selling yeah. feed burner to Google. Oh, truckloads of money. Tr truckloads of That's money. That's why we had to move. We had a house that wasn't big enough to hold it all, so we had to move to a, but you know, a warehouse where it's a little bad and then piles of money. You've done the startup thing. You've yeah. got kids. You, I mean, you know, do you. Why did you want to uproot everyone and move back here and jump into this again? So we actually decided to move um, before uh, the Twitter thing happened and it's funny because I've gotten about 50 emails saying you know I knew when you were moving that you were going to work at Twitter but, <laughs> and, I, and to which I always respond you know I wish you would have told me then I would have saved me a lot of trouble <laughs> we planned on moving um, basically because we've always we've always thought about living out here we have we all have my wife and I have tons of friends out here our daughter's going into sixth grade so it was kind of like one of those well you know we're gonna move. We better move now before our daughter goes into junior high and high school and wants right. to run away or hit us in the head with a mallet <laughs> if we move her when when she's going into high school. So um, you know, we had lots of family in the near the Chicago area that have kind of moved away, and so uh, the ties we had there weren't as important anymore, and we moved out here. Once we decided to move out here, um, I was fully planning on doing another startup at some point. Did you know what you were months. thinking about? No, I, I really didn't, and I was just planning on taking a few months and you know take some vacations and hang out and get moved into this place so and, much for uh, that so much for that yeah <laughs> I mean so so in fact um, when when they asked me I think when I've asked me my first reaction was look you know not, not really interested in that I'm gonna go do my own thing um, and then the more I thought about it you know I said this to a couple people the more I thought about it the more I thought pivotal internet companies only come along you know well they come along rarely maybe right. there's been 10 since 1994 right there's Netscape and Google and AOL and and Facebook and Yahoo and you know and eBay and there's not like there's not like 50 more there's there's 10 or 20 right and and this has the potential to be one of them right. it's not yet but has the potential to be one of them and so the odds of working at a company where the, Mike Arrington is looking over Sarah's shoulder trying to get my attention. He's now, such a micromanager. Which is why I'm being distracted. <laughs> Make sure you ask the tough questions. She's asking the tough questions. I was about so, to ask a really jerky one. So I'll go, we'll, we can move right on to that then. I think I've answered this. It's it's an opportunity to work on a pivotal internet company right. and not just on other startup. Now you have been Here friends. Here comes the jerky you, question. This is the jerky question. You've been friends with Evan and um, you've you, have you been on Twitter's board, or are you just an investor? You've been involved. Just an investor. So you've been involved with yeah. the company. Yeah. One thing I've heard from Twitter board members as a complaint is that the company tends to be very overstaffed by Evan's friends and not necessarily the best people for the job. Uh -huh. So are you saying that he's not? Uh, did you did you have that issue as an investor? Did you have any concern going into the company about that? Do you think that's a fair no, representation at all? I mean, it might be a fair representation. I think that. It's a good question. Um, I was told never to say that's a good question a long time ago. <laughs> it's a drinking game. It's part of the Tech Crunch 50 drinking game. It, and then I repeated it, so I got <laughs> lulled into it. Um, I think that that could also be a positive thing, right? I mean, I don't know necessarily, it's, it's probably true. I don't necessarily know that it's a bad thing. I think mm -hmm. that you can also, it certainly happened in any number of companies where you bring in um, other senior members of the management team and you don't know them well but look the board knows that this guy was an A player here and mm -hmm. you know we got to get an all-star CFO and so you bring in someone the board recommends or someone that that interviews well but that no one knows mm -hmm. and you know the the road to, the road to bankruptcy is littered with companies that have done have 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 ruined the culture of the company uh -huh. by bringing in people that weren't a good fit and blow things up and you have to start over and the management team goes through a over redo from scratch. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to be um, 
culturally sensitive to making sure I want right. I want the first X people in the company to be people I'm pretty sure we're comfortable with. So, you know, yeah, look, if it continues, you know, I'm only going to hire my friends and you're a thousand person company. <laughs> That's why I'm pretty soon you. you're bringing in <laughs> Schmucky to, you know, run, well, he's going to be the CFO because he's the last guy on, on Facebook who doesn't work here that I'm a friend with. So, you know, that's bad. Obviously, uh -huh. that can't continue. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing in the, in the early going. So, what, I know you're not going to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway and just be obnoxious. Yep. What would be the I price? I thought the last question was the obnoxious question. No, that was the obnoxious one you'll answer. This oh, is the obnoxious one you won't answer. Yeah, I can, I can already tell. What would be the price? I like, mean, it's like everyone I know knows. I know you guys don't want to sell, and it's like whenever there's a Twitter yeah. acquisition thing, I'm just like, come on. Like, yeah. can we move on to a more interesting story? Like, yeah. to me, I also find the when are they going to make revenue not yeah. particularly that yeah. interesting of a story. Agreed. But there is a number. There is a number by which being a company that has had to raise capital, you would absolutely have to consider it. Is it lower than a billion dollars? I have no idea what the number is. Look, so I think I'll, I'll make a well, couple. Put your I'll investor couple, hat on. I'll make a couple. I'll make a couple statements. Okay. I think that one thing that Ev and Biz has have said repeatedly now, which I think is a really a thing you don't hear from startup founders that are in a fast-growing company very frequently is, look, we're not interested in selling this. Uh -huh. so, that, the great thing about that statement is it plants a stake in the ground with the staff to not get spun up every time you hear like, oh, mm -hmm. why was, you know, that guy in here yesterday? I read in, you know, this so-and-so that Ev was walking down the street with, you know, uh, some, you know, some, some CEO Smith. of some company. Right. So, uh, oh, oh, someone wants to cross. Wants to Go cross, ahead. Crossing. This is a diversion tactic yeah. that you... So, so that's the first point. <laughs> I would say those guys have put that stake in the ground, which is great because people don't constantly fret about it or mm -hmm. get spun up when when things get spun up in the media. I think the second thing is the the benefit of saying that. And so this is coming from someone who who did sell this company, you know, right. got a company that was going along and going on along nicely and got an offer we felt we couldn't refuse and we took it. The benefit of those guys saying that is when you don't have that perspective, there's always the possibility that something might happen tomorrow that's going to cause us to sell it. And mm -hmm. I think the fact that those guys have said it and believe it. I mean, you know, we've had these conversations. Those guys are committed to that. Uh -huh. um, that takes this big weight off your shoulder. Right. And you don't have to worry about, you know, when, when you know, well, X, Y, Z come yeah. calls tomorrow and says they want to buy us. You can kind of say like, you know, we're not really, we don't even want to have that well, conversation. Well, because it's never even as simple as an yeah. offer. It's like you've got to engage in this it, look, dance. Look, look gotta... it's like I, I once told someone that, I think it was Stuart Butterfield, when he, when he and Katarina were doing Flickr, before they sold to Yahoo, I said, you know, M&A discussions are like 16-year-olds trying to date each other. It's never like, hey, um, I want to yeah. go out with you, let's go out. It's always like, hey, um, if you liked me, <laughs> I maybe would want to talk Check to you. Check yes. You know, and then, and then the other guy goes, well, if you were to want to talk to me, I might be happy to talk to you, but I, but I do know that this other guy wants to talk to me. Uh -huh. More passing. So I know. <laughs> you just go, it's this whole process. And, and I think by these guys having said, like, hey, we're not interested in that, then you don't even get to the point where you get a number, right? right. So, so I think that, so that's kind of my first point I would make, even though it was 10 minutes. Um, I didn't yeah, talk these videos are supposed panel, to be under so five minutes. I'm not saying it all now. <laughs> I think that's the first important point. And I think a second point is, look, you can't, no one's going to ever say, like, we would never sell this. I don't right. think anyone would ever say that. Um, because well, someone comes along and says, okay, we'll give you a hundred billion dollars. You say, well, right. okay. Of course, we, of course, we have to do that now. Your your investor would sue you if you didn't, right? You're violating your fiduciary obligation to your shareholders. So, the problem with having these ethereal discussions, though, about what's the number is, it's never that number. Right. There's always these realities that are, that come into play, which is what company is it? Is it do I gotta do I have to go work there for four years? Do I have to work for you know Schmucky, who was my who I hired as my CFO? <laughs> Schmucky again. Because I only hired my friends, and now he's gonna be my boss at the new company. I don't want to do that. Uh, Schmucky again. Yeah. Right. So there's there's never uh, if you had to sell it, what would the number be? Because it's always different. Right. You know, we went through this exercise. I remember it. You know. Um, at Feedburn, like what would then you know? Because you start having these conversations, you say, okay, what's the number? And the, what ends up happening is never that. Right. So you just okay. It's useless to have, have to. That to was get the longest no comment I've ever heard in the history yeah. of time. But it wasn't really no comment. I mean, I'm being, <laughs> I'm being you know, I'm trying to be. No, you're being thoughtful. Uh, genuine. Um. Last question. Yeah. Evan has been very candid 
about how he did not enjoy his time at Google after selling Blogger yeah. to Google. Yeah. Did you have the same experience no. selling no. Hey I was I was working for Susan Wojcicki and I've, you know, said this to anyone who will listen, who is like one of my favorite, you know, people on the planet. I think I learned a ton of stuff working for her. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so she's managing ad, the ads product group at Google. Um, which is like, you know, the company. Right. <laughs> I mean, the most popular it's part, it's anyway. Would say it's <laughs> of course, there's applications and whatnot, but let's face it. Um, and, you know, she's very calm, very pragmatic, um, doesn't get uh, impatient, mm -hmm. um, and it, despite, a, you know, absolutely hectic schedule, um, very thoughtful, super high bandwidth. Just, I just really enjoyed working with her. Mm -hmm. um, she gave me the space to be very entrepreneurial in my role. I was only, you know, I wasn't doing fever integration there. I, I went off and did um, social product, uh, social media ads for the product mm -hmm. team. Um, and my co-founder Steve managed, Steve Olakowski managed uh, fever integration. Um, so no, I was perfectly content. I mean.